Are you someone who has eaten large quantities of supposedly healthy superfoods? Have you a history of eating a diet high in oxalates, including but not limited to these foods? Or alternatively, do you suffer from any of the following health conditions? If so, you could be dealing with oxalate overload, a dietary plant toxin, which for those of you who don't know, is similar to accumulating shards of glass in your organs and your soft tissues. This is Elliot from EO Nutrition, and in today's video, you'll learn about the most common signs and symptoms of oxalate accumulation in the human body. First of all, if you're new to Oxalate, make sure to check out the previous video, which gives a basic overview. But before we look at how you can spot and identify Oxalate overload, there are some people who don't even believe that this exists, except in very rare circumstances. So first of all, let's address some of those points. So hyperoxaluria and oxalosis are medical terms for oxalate overload and is most often associated with a rare condition called hyperoxaluria. In these people, the liver produces too much of its own oxalate, which spills into the blood, reaching a critical threshold and then crystallizes in tissues. Some might tell you that oxalate coming in from the diet doesn't affect blood levels to any significant extent. This idea is flat out wrong. You can see this study, which showed that the amount of oxalate found in just 100 grams of spinach was enough to increase urine excretion equivalent to that found in genetic hyperoxaluria. It also found significant elevations in the blood. Others will then say that eating a super high oxalate diet is really healthy and that it won't cause you any problems if you don't have kidney issues. They might also tell you not to worry because oxalate only affects the kidneys. It can't cause problems anywhere else in the body. All of this, again, is wrong. Whilst it's true that kidney disease is a common cause for oxalate accumulation, just look at this model, which showed that even a mild elevation in blood oxalate led to an accumulation in bone and soft tissues, which were up to 360 times higher than in plasma. But most importantly, all of this happened with normal kidney function. This demonstrates that the kidneys don't need to be damaged for the body to start accumulating oxalate. Rather, it's a well-known fact that juicing vegetables and fruits which are high in oxalate can cause acute kidney failure in some people. This has been documented on numerous occasions in the past within the scientific literature. So now that we've established that a high oxalate diet can increase oxalate in the blood, and those high levels in the blood can then start to accumulate inside the tissue, we can then go on to understand the most common type of symptom that someone is likely to experience. First and foremost, it's gonna be pain of any kind, which is mostly chronic, but can also be cyclical, meaning that it comes and goes. The reason for this is really quite simple. Oxalate, like a shard of glass, can stick in the tissue, cause mechanical stress, cause mechanical irritation and inflammation. In the joints, it mimics arthritis. In the literature, this is called oxalate arthropathy. In the bone, it can cause bone pain, leaching of minerals leading to osteoporosis and fractures. When it deposits in the nervous tissue, not only can it disrupt the nervous system, it can also trigger neuropathy, meaning pins and needles, tingling, burning, aching, and stabbing pains. Here is what it looks like in the nerves. In the skin, it can cause heightened skin sensitivity, like in fibromyalgia. It can cause rashes, pustules, even irritant conditions. Here is what it looks like in the skin. Now, obviously, kidney stones are the most obvious symptom, but even without stones, oxalate can cause pain in the kidney area and throughout the entire urinary tract. People don't need to develop kidney stones to experience the effects. The amount of oxalate found in one spinach smoothie was enough to cause massive excretion of nanocrystals in the urine. Nanocrystals are thought to be more dangerous to epithelial tissue than are larger stones. And just so that you know, the bladder lining is made up of exactly this kind of tissue. Since oxalate in the urine comes in direct contact with the bladder on its way out of the body, painful bladder conditions are also common. In the bladder, it can present as burning, difficulty urinating, stinging, aching, or interstitial cystitis. It should therefore be no surprise that cystitis is associated with a past history of kidney stones, and approximately 80% of those stones are made up of oxalate. Some people also develop chronic urinary tract infections. As it happens, oxalate is considered to be a risk factor for infection, and crystals can act as storage houses for bacteria such as E. coli. Likewise, on its way out, it can also lodge in the vaginal mucosa and is a primary driver of a condition called vulvodynia. In this supposedly uncurable condition, one study found that 50% of participants who followed a low oxalate diet saw improvements. In fact, there's an entire foundation which was created based on low oxalate diets to cure this condition. Since oxalate has a very high affinity for different minerals, in particular calcium, it can form calcifications throughout the body. And this basically leads us to another really common symptom that people have. This has been found in the spine, the shoulder blades, the fingers, and many other places. Now you may experience these as hard deposits or grittiness in your joints and maybe when you move around, 
Or if you're one of the unlucky ones, you won't even know it's there at all. Like in the blood vessels, where it calcifies the vessel lining, making it stiff and rigid. In people without any genetic conditions, oxalate calcifications have been found in the arteries, and oxalosis is now thought by some to be a major driver in people with atherosclerosis. High oxalate in the diet was even found to be associated with a higher risk of cardiovascular events. Clearly, conventional scientists are starting to catch on as they cite diet as the leading cause of of oxalate overload outside of genetic conditions. Another organ which seems super sensitive to oxalate is actually the thyroid gland. Accumulation has been found in a host of thyroid diseases. Even in normal people, one report found oxalate crystals in 79 out of 100 autopsies. Another found oxalate in 73%, with the highest prevalence in those over 70 years of age and none in children under 10 years old. Now this clearly supports the idea that it accumulates in people over long spans of time. Most interestingly, they also found evidence that higher amounts of oxalate were associated with lower thyroid function. And this is exactly what some people report anecdotally. In fact, after starting the low oxalate diet, there are many people who experience improvements in their thyroid function. To go on, there's a long list of symptoms that someone might potentially experience when they have a problem with oxalate. It's really different for every person. What we do know is that oxalate deposits in the gut, for instance. It causes microbial dysbiosis. Other symptoms range from simple mood disturbances all the way to a broad spectrum of autoimmune conditions and other types of chronic inflammation. What's clear is that there's really no one size fits all and it affects different people in different ways. For more information, I recommend you checking out the Trying Low Oxalate Facebook group run by a team of moderators who've been studying this thing for practically decades. But the question we're now left with is how do you know if it's causing you a problem? The answer is really quite simple. The best and perhaps the only way to know is by starting a low oxalate diet and watching out for dumping symptoms. However, to practically do this is a little bit more complicated and that is what we're gonna focus on in the next video. So stay tuned.